Well, I love looking in old photograph albums, especially ones that have black and white pictures of people and things past. A thing about black and white photos is that they always leave you wondering, what color was that person's hair or their eyes? How blue was the sky? And you have so many more questions. Well, today's reading is a snapshot of a meeting. Family members, friends, and a mother making her request to Jesus. It's like freezing the frame in a video, holding the moment when the question is asked, and we wait with bated breath for Jesus' reply. When we look at famous paintings of Jesus and the people around him, the artist has similarly frozen a moment in time. Their hands are raised, movement stopped, so that we can look into that moment with great depth. Time stands still as we gaze on the scene. Likewise, in today's reading, we have entered into a moment when the mother of the two disciples, James and John, comes to Jesus. She kneels before him, a gesture of submission maybe, wanting Jesus to take her request seriously. It may be that she was a relative of Jesus. Some have suggested that she was the sister of Jesus' mother and that her name was Salome. Maybe she felt she could influence Jesus, pull on the strings of a family connection. Did the boys not have the courage to ask Jesus for themselves? Or was she an ambitious mother, keen for the advancement of her sons in this kingdom Jesus claimed he was building? So there we have it. Snapshot one, Zebedee's wife on her knees before Jesus. But what is happening in the background of this picture? The 10 other disciples become indignant. As she asked a question they also wanted to ask Jesus. Have James and John stolen their thunder, as it were, and got in there with a question they secretly wanted to ask Jesus too? And so we move to snapshot two, Jesus responds. Having asked what she wants and heard her question, Jesus responds, you don't know what you're asking. And that's all the reply she gets. Not exactly dismissing her question, but Jesus does not address her any further. So snapshot three, Jesus turns and addresses James and John. Can you drink the cup I'm going to drink? We can, they answered. Sometimes we make declarations without really understanding the full implication of what they mean. Some commitments are made when we're feeling full of joy, excitement, anticipation, marriage commitments, for example. It all feels good and right at the time, and we feel we can fulfill the promises we made at that moment. Sometimes we give our word to a friend, declare we can complete a task, fulfill a request from someone without fully understanding the implication that it will entail. Here are James and John standing there in front of their peers and their mother. Bravado kicks in these, to these sons, sons of thunder. Of course we can do whatever you're asking, Jesus. So we move to snapshot four. Let's zoom in and have a close up of John. What do we see? Who do we see? A young man who loved and was very much loved by his mother. Like his brother, James, he was a fiery young man. Their nicknames were Sons of Thunder. Their father was a fisherman who hired out other men to help in the family firm, Zebedee and Sons, which no doubt was a successful fishing business. John was a seeker after God, having been a follower of John the Baptist. However, when John the Baptist pointed out Jesus as the Lamb of God, fisherman John left John the Baptist and followed after Jesus. And when Jesus called him to be a disciple, both John and his brother James left their father and their fisher to be with Jesus. So let's zoom in a bit closer into John's eyes. What do we read in John's eyes? The way he looks at Jesus. 
Meeting Jesus must have made a great impression on John because years later, he documents the exact time of his visitation to Jesus' house. This fiery and impetuous young man had met his match. Here was a man worth, worthy of following, someone stronger than himself in different ways. He had rough carpenter's hands, a man used to shaping and forming items out of wood. John had rough fisherman's hands, calloused from drawing in the nets, bronzed from the constant outdoor work, his skin tough from exposure to all weathers. Now Jesus is asking this question, can you drink the cup I'm going to drink? John is not entirely sure what the cup means. Maybe it's part of what is required to bring in this kingdom Jesus keeps talking about. I don't think his mind would have strayed in the direction of suffering and death, or if it did, it wouldn't have lingered there. What John knows in his heart is that he loves Jesus and he would follow him wherever he led. But there's a lot of talk about being a servant, being a slave. Whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant and whoever wants to be first must be your slave. John had learned his trade from his father Zebedee and really thought this was a job for life. He had it made. A skilled fisherman would always be able to support a family. Maybe his mother if she became a widow. Actually, his mother thought she, he was great. She was ambitious for him to get on. And with the talk about a new kingdom, maybe there would be positions of power and influence to be had. His mother was not going to miss an opportunity for the advancement of both her sons. Parents can be great at bigging up their children, making them feel better than others, a cut above the rest. Combined with the fiery temperament, this might have made both John and James forces to be reckoned with. When a mother says, you're the best enough times, you come to believe it. You're looking for greatness and favour in all you put your hand to. This was the John who declared he could drink the cup that Jesus would offer him. Jesus was special. There was something so amazingly other about him. After all, John had seen his glory on Mount Tabor. He had heard God say, this is my son whom I love, listen to him. He had witnessed Jesus raise the daughter of Jairus to life. Jesus had power. He was in some mysterious way God's son. Yet he talked about being a servant, that being a slave would make you great in his kingdom. It was all very confusing. And now to snapshot five. Now we turn the page in the photo album and here's another snapshot. Not a nice one. But John is standing by the crucified Jesus. The rabbi, the master he loves, is nailed to a cross. He is exposed to the world, this man he loved so much, being mocked and taunted by passers-by. John is different now. He has changed. The three years he spent with this amazing man have transformed him. He still has a long way to go, but he's not the same roughly hewn fisherman he was three years earlier. He's seen such a lot, learned so much about God and prayer and miracles and loving and healing. So much that if he wrote it all down, even the whole world would not have room for the books that would be written. John is no longer seeking to be greatest according to the world's standards. He wants to be great according to God's kingdom standards. If we zoom in on his eyes now, we will see they are different. They are softened by love. Love for the master, love for the brothers, love for everyone. His heart has changed too. His are the hands Jesus places his mother into, to look after and care for. Jesus knew God's, John's heart, and he knew that John knew Jesus' heart. Here was a disciple who had learned lessons from his time with the master. 
Here was a man who had grasped them of the gospel message to love one another as Jesus had loved them and who Jesus could trust to carry that out with his own mother. Here was a man who had plumbed the depths of the mystery of the incarnation, who came to believe and understand that Jesus was the word made flesh, that Jesus was the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, John penned those most famous words, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. John witnessed that incredible act of servant love when Jesus washed his feet at the last supper they shared together. And he waited with anticipation and expectation for the gift of the Holy Spirit that Jesus promised. John knew himself to be a branch of the true vine, his Lord and Master Jesus Christ, and without him he was nothing. John testified to his lived faith and visions in his gospel, his three letters and the book of Revelation. He knew the most important thing is to, be, is to follow Jesus, to be obedient to him, and God would take care of the rest. He lost the sense of self-importance, such that he didn't even name himself in his gospel accounts, rather calling himself the disciple Jesus loved. John's life was a journey from the fiery and judgmental John to the beloved John, resting his head on Jesus' breast and writing about love. One of the early church fathers, Jerome, recorded that in his last years, John was carried to church by the young men of the community, where John would simply say to the gathered Christians, little children, love one another, love one another, love one another. So I'd just like to close with some verses from 1 John 4. Dear friends, let us love one another, for love comes from God. Everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God, because God is love. This is how God showed his love among us. He sent his one and only son into the world that we might live through him. This is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Dear friends, since God so loved us, we ought also to love one another. No one has ever seen God, but if we love one another, God lives in us and his love is made complete in us. Amen. Amen.